December 1984. A resident of Ozaki County, Wisconsin makes a gruesome discovery in their driveway. It's the body of a woman. She is laying in the snow. Her clothes are mostly off. Her head is bloodied. There's blood spattered in the snow and on the trees. It was clear she was beaten brutally to death. It was totally senseless. It disgusted me that someone would treat another human being like this. The victim, it emerges, had been to a party. Where she went after that and how she ended up in the driveway she did was the 35-year mystery. Her murder sent shockwaves throughout the county. There was a severe fear among the community, and they wanted to know that this person wasn't walking the streets. Certainly for young women in the community, it was terrifying. And I think a lot of people were concerned who might be next. A major investigation is launched with hundreds of suspects eliminated. We knew it had to be somebody that was familiar with the area where she was killed. They had a lot of possible suspects, but one by one, blood typing alone was able to eliminate most of them. In 2019, detectives determined to find the killer turned to a new groundbreaking DNA method. This is now taking that genealogy DNA and now comparing the evidence to that. This was huge for investigators because it meant that they could start swabbing and eliminating the suspects that they had. This is the story of Tracy Hammerberg, her random and brutal killing, how the perpetrator evaded detection for decades, and how his identity was eventually uncovered by the bloodline detectives. We were invested in this case from day one and we're not gonna let it go. On the 15th of December 1984, the Ozaki County Sheriff's Office in Wisconsin received an emergency call. There was a resident on Maple Road in the town of Grafton that was on his way to get his early morning newspaper. And he came across the body of a young girl. She is laying in the snow. Her clothes are mostly off. Her head is bloodied. There's blood spattered in the snow and on the trees. So he returned back to the home and then called the sheriff's office and notified us. After that, he went back and stayed with the body until the sheriff's office could arrive. When police arrived at the scene, it was unclear if the young woman was still alive, but it was immediately apparent she had suffered a ferocious assault. There was some talk by the resident that found her that he thought he heard breathing, so they did uh, contact rescue and rescue attempts were made, but she was found to be dead. The victim was lying on her back and her arms and legs were spread to the sides and she was half naked from the waist down, apart from her socks, which had been partially removed. Her jacket, scarf, and sweater had been pulled up over her head, exposing her chest and breasts. Her face and neck were heavily bruised, showing that she had clearly taken a beating, and her hair was matted with blood and brain tissue. She had uh, blows to the right side of her skull. I mean, it was brutal. It was, it was, it was horrible. I froze the scene. and I called for help, uh, other investigators, and the state crime lab. Backup teams and forensics arrived and started processing the scene. They were quick to find what appeared to be evidence. They located tire impressions in the snow. It was a fresh snowfall that occurred over the evening, and there was also blood splatters in the snow, as well as in the trees. Police noticed that there was a packet of Marlboro cigarettes inches away from the victim, and that was bagged for evidence. She had a men's sapphire high school ring on her hand, 
and on one side it said Bowdoin High 1983 and on the other it said Glen 83. Her clothing had been thrown uh, near her head. Her jeans, her shoes were all recovered at the scene. There's no murder weapon. There's nothing left behind to say this is what was used to kill Tracy, but it was clear she was beaten brutally to death. Her hands were bagged to preserve any evidence, and then her body was placed onto a bed sheet, and it was taken to the hospital for any x-rays to see what had been done to her skull or her body, and then it was taken onto the morgue. Detectives attended the autopsy, which was conducted at six o'clock the same evening. The victim had reddish brown hair. She was about five foot six, and she had an identifiable tattoo on her arm, which was a red heart with a blue arrow through it. There was small bits of brain material on her clothing and body, as well as some dark hair that didn't belong to her. She had numerous fractures to her skull that were overlapping, and whatever she had been hit with it had been a rounded object. It was a bludgeoning with what kind of tool police either didn't know or wouldn't say that was some sort of a metal object. Um, could have been a tire iron, could have been uh, something else, but it was, it was a metal object. She had severe bruising on her chest that was below her collarbone and consistent with a footprint, suggesting someone had stood on her. There was no indication of any restraint or bindings on her arms or legs, showing that she was taken by surprise. The cause of death for autopsy was blunt trauma, but there was also petechia, which would be indicative of manual strangulation. There was also bruising and tearage in her vaginal and rectal area, suggesting that she had been raped. Vaginal, oral, and rectal swabs were taken. She had been sexually assaulted, raped, strangled, and she had been bludgeoned to death. It was brutal. It was a brutal murder. Investigators did not have long to wait for the victim to be identified. The murder was covered on the local news. Her parents did not report her missing to the police. She kind of had a lifestyle which she, she would come and go freely from, from home. Her half-sister said she learned about it on the news. They saw a breaking news cut into the Muppet movie that was on television and heard that this body had been found. And uh, she said her mother immediately said, that's Tracy. Judy Lipka phoned the police and said that her daughter had not come home and she had heard on the news that a girl had been found. She said that her daughter had red dyed hair and a heart tattoo with a blue arrow through it and that she also had a ring on her that had been given to her by her boyfriend. She said her daughter was Tracy Hammerberg and she was 18 years old. So officers immediately knew that this was the victim who had been discovered. So who was Tracy Hammerberg and why would anyone have wanted to kill her? It appeared that Tracy was no stranger to risk in her life. She certainly didn't seem afraid to hang out with people who were dangerous and associated with people who were known to law enforcement and maybe had had some issues of their own, whether it was as juveniles or as young adults. They got in trouble themselves. They had their own issues. So um, the focus, I think, originally was with them. How she ended up in the driveway she did was the 35-year mystery. In December 1984, the body of a young woman had been found by a resident of Ozaki County, Wisconsin. She'd been beaten to death following a violent sexual assault. The victim had been identified as 18-year-old Tracy Hammerberg. Tracy was a high school student who was friendly, well-liked, uh, popular, seemed to have uh, a lot of circles of friends. Tracy lived at home with her younger half-sister and her mother and her stepfather. She had a harder life than most for her age, but she liked the same things a lot of us liked. She liked to go out and be with her friends and party and have a good time. And 
and think she was just a typical 18-year-old girl. She liked to have fun. She drank and she smoked some marijuana, which was probably quite common of the group of uh, people that she had uh, associated with. Tracy was already known to the police. Tracy had a history of being a runaway and she had been in and out of the house for some time. Tracy had told friends that she had had a problem with her stepfather and that he had been making unwanted advances towards her. And this explained why she was running away from home so often. She had some difficulties when she was younger. She'd finally gone onto the right path. She was gonna move out of state and move with her boyfriend in North Dakota, but that was stopped by her killer. It was unclear to investigators if Tracy had been killed where her body had been found or whether it was a dump site, but given the location, it was likely the killer knew the area. The place where she was found is not really known by too many people. That road is very isolated, you know, uh, and uh, especially the driveway is even more isolated. Of all the places on this road you could hide a body or dump a body, why here? The family that lived at that location was looked at very hard by investigators, not only immediately after it happened, but throughout the years. I think you have to look at those people. You have to eliminate them as being part of uh, the crime. Just because of its isolation, it's a place where you probably wouldn't be unless you know that that's there. Detectives now received information about a vehicle which had been seen in the area where Tracy's body was found. One of the neighbors said that she saw a green pickup truck. And she also saw a man in his late 20s, early 30s, who had medium brown hair. And he had left the car running for about a half an hour and then came back. Officers managed to track down the man who owned the green pickup truck, and it turned out that he was a hunter. He was about to go out, but he noticed squealing wheels uh, coming from a car that had no headlights on. He thought that it was like a larger car, maybe a station wagon, but he didn't get a good look at it. At this stage, police had a time frame in mind because the car had been witnessed by a few different people. As investigators gathered more information, they began to piece together Tracy's movements in the hours before her death. On Friday, December 14th, Tracy had been babysitting for a woman called Helen Michaels from about 7.20 to 9.45 p.m. Tracy had left the house, but before she did, she had a conversation with Helen and she agreed to come back and babysit the next morning at 7.30. After finishing babysitting, Tracy met some of her friends and they went to a house on Garfield Road in Port Washington. There they played a drinking game called Quarters and sort of hung out and smoked a little marijuana. Her friends then said, hey, why don't I give you a lift? But she declined. And instead she left about 12.30 on foot. Detectives were unclear what had happened from here. One of the biggest mysteries was what happened when she left the house. Did she get a ride? Did she go this way? Did she go that way? There were a number of different stories that police were getting from the people at that party. The most reliable account they had was that Tracy had walked home, or at least began the walk home from Port Washington to Sockville. If you look at the pictures from the crime scene, there's snow on the ground. It's December, it's cold. On a four mile walk in the snow, it wouldn't have been unusual for Tracy to have hitched a ride. It was common for many people to hitchhike. My theory was that someone picked Tracy up, took her to go party, uh, maybe drink some more beer, and made advances towards her. She denied those advances, and then the person killed her. From witness accounts and interviews, police now began to collate a list of suspects. Through speaking to friends and family, police figured out that Tracy smoked menthol cigarettes. So the cigarettes that were found at the crime scene had likely belonged to the killer. There was a great focus on the party, the house that she was last seen at. 
And after those people were eliminated, you just had to widen the circle. You know, who did she know? Who hung out with her? Who else might she have encountered that, that morning when she left? She seemed to be the kind of person that gave investigators a rich list of potential suspects because of the people she associated with. The circle of her associates was very wide. She moved freely in all those groups. She was able to move about. And that caused problems, really, for the investigation because it wasn't just one group we could focus on. We had to, we had to focus on numerous groups. We kept on looking at different circles of friends that Tracy had, people she went to school with, people she hung out with, people in her neighborhood, people are associated with other family members, other friends. We knew it had to be somebody that knew Tracy, and somebody had to be familiar with the area where she was killed. Investigators pursued hundreds of suspects and witnesses. They looked at every different type of tip and lead. They used lots of different theories and different techniques to try and figure out who might have done this, but they were never successful. Detectives were extremely concerned. Murders were incredibly rare in Ozaki County. In 1984, Violent crime like this was virtually unheard of in Port Washington. This wasn't just a murder. This was a high school student, and so it was the buzz of the community. Anytime there's a homicide of a young girl and the killer is not known, there always is that apprehension in the community that the killer may strike again. Then horror struck again. Another young woman, a friend of Tracy's, was discovered murdered. In July 1985, just six months after Tracy had been brutally killed, a friend of hers, 18-year-old Wendy Smith, had been found beaten, raped, and murdered. She had been with friends, left their house, and was going to meet her mother, who worked at a tavern. However, she never turned up, and 24 hours later, they found her body on top of the hillside. Certainly for young women in the community, it was terrifying. Two young women had died. Was there a serial killer? They didn't know. And I think a lot of people were concerned who might be next. Just not knowing uh, what, what happened, uh, who did that, uh, who would do that. There was fear, there was concern. That's what would have made this all the more shocking. Close-knit, small communities, this kind of thing doesn't happen. The Ozaki Sheriff's Department and the Port Washington Police, where Wendy's body was found, started working together. They thought maybe there might be some links to these two murders. They shared acquaintances and friends, so obviously police were thinking maybe it was someone who both of the girls had known. Detectives tried to develop a lead on a suspect using the assistance of the FBI. There was a FBI profile made on the likely suspect. Part of the profile would, would show that Tracy most likely knew who her killer was. They were looking for a loner, Someone who operated on the fringes of groups of friends, who didn't have close friends. Um, someone who was prone to violence. Somebody who had been involved in crimes, but not to the extent where they would appear on our radar. Investigators were able to determine that forensics did not match from the two different crimes, and they were able to show that these had been committed by two separate people. Detectives had sent the evidence collected for the autopsy for testing, and from the analysis were able to eliminate suspects. The laboratory examined the vaginal swabs from the autopsy, and they discovered that semen was present. Further analysis was done, and they found that the individual had O blood type and two identifiable enzymes, one of which is only found in 3% of the US population. By today's standards, this was fairly primitive information. 1984, you didn't have the kind of DNA matching technology we have now. They were able to test blood type, and that blood analysis could eliminate about 98% of the population. Old boy friends. Friends that uh, uh, people gave us tips on, we would ask them to volunteer for a blood sample, and then that blood was transferred over to the state crime lab for analysis. Sometimes it would take uh, weeks. There was also a backup at the crime lab, and sometimes a month to get results back. 
They had a lot of possible suspects, but one by one, blood typing alone was able to eliminate most of them. We never had a, a match, and we did uh, a lot of people. I, I lost count. Even though investigators had exhausted every possibility, the killer continued to evade detection, and the case eventually went cold. I know it was on the minds of people in Port Washington and never left their minds. People have always wanted to know, are we ever gonna find out who killed Tracy? We were invested in this case from day one and we're not gonna let it go sit on a shelf somewhere. We were gonna continue to work this case until we solved it or until there was no other rocks to turn over. In January 1985, police in Ozaki County, Wisconsin, were investigating the murder of 18-year-old Tracy Hammerberg, whose body had been found beaten, sexually assaulted, and strangled the previous month. But the case had run up against a brick wall and had gone cold. The detectives, however, weren't willing to let go. All of the police officers who worked on this were really trying to solve this case. I mean, this was a woman who had been brutally murdered and they wanted to bring her killer to justice. Maybe because there aren't as many murders in Port Washington, maybe it's because they just felt Tracy was an innocent victim who deserved justice. You know, would you give up on your own loved one? Um, I think they took it personally. It was just one of those things that it was with you 24 seven. You always thought about it. You know, you'd be at home watching a movie and something would pop into your head and you'd call the other investigators and say, you know what, maybe we need to check this angle or maybe we need to do that. It was just always there. The term cold case suggests it sat in a file somewhere and no one was working it and they got a break years later or a tip. But if you look at the file, you see that over the years, they continued to work this methodically year after year after year even through changes in personnel, people who retired, new people came in. It's remarkable the consistency they showed after all these years. When I started the sheriff's office in 1991, this was a case that was being worked on at that time. I was interested in the case. I had gone to the same high school as her, and I grew up in the same community. So some of the people in the case, I knew who they were. So I thought that would be a benefit in the investigation. Investigators were also determined to keep the case in the public mind. About 10 years ago, I got a phone call from Jeff Taylor at the Ozaki County Sheriff's Office who said, we've got this cold case and we'd really like to get some attention. Would you be willing to do a story on this case and help us maybe generate some leads? They opened up the metal cabinets, pulled out the case files, set them down and said, have at it. Reading through the file is almost like a novel that as you read it, you're like, well, here's the suspect. They have the murderer. Why am I still reading this? Why isn't it solved? But then the person is cleared through forensics. The volumes of people they talked to, any little bit of information they followed up on, uh, it was evident throughout that case file. It was an emotional roller coaster, uh, even 20, over 20 years after the homicide. We put together a story and uh, hoped maybe that would lead to someone coming forward with information that would finally solve this cold case. And, you know, for another nine, 10 years, crickets, we didn't hear anything. Between Tracy's murder in 1984 and the early 1990s, forensic techniques had come a long way. DNA profiling was revolutionizing crime fighting and the national database, CODIS, was expanding. In 1995, the State Crime Laboratory was able to create the first DNA profile, and that profile was uploaded onto CODIS. Unfortunately, there were no matches. We just continued to do our samples, to take our samples, and whatever the newest uh, evolution of DNA was, that's how we compared it. They always wanted to have one DNA sample that they knew was off to the crime lab, so that there was always that possibility they were gonna get a match. So they'd go out and interview more people and get more samples just to keep this case alive. And I think for nearly 35 years they did. And each time we spoke with uh, suspects or people that knew Tracy, we'd ask for additional names. For other people that we could talk to that maybe knew Tracy, 
and maybe we're in the fringes of these, of these other friends. The state crime lab ran CODIS monthly for our case. We knew if we got the DNA from the suspect, we would know who killed Tracy. Because part of the evidence that, that we didn't tell the general public was that in addition to the DNA from the semen that was found inside Tracy's body, we also had the same DNA profile underneath Tracy's fingernails. So it was evident to us that whoever raped Tracy also killed Tracy, and that Tracy had tried to defend herself by scratching her assailant. More than 400 samples were tested, the most of any cold case in Wisconsin history, which I think demonstrates the commitment to the case. But as they kept striking out, you think at a certain point, are they gonna run out of people? And it wasn't until this whole new technique came along that they got the big break in the case. Over 2,000 miles away in California, police were announcing their success in tracking down a notorious serial killer and rapist. April 2018, police in California held a news conference where they announced that they had apprehended the Golden State Killer. This was a man who committed over 50 rapes and at least 13 murders between 1974 and 1986. He had been tracked down by a new technique called forensic genealogy, and the Ozaki Police Department thought maybe this was a technique they could apply to Tracy Hammerberg's murder. There were actually a couple of us at the department who had recently done our own genealogy and thought if we could upload some of the DNA of our suspect into a genealogy tree, this would be fantastic. One of our investigators was able to reach out to the FBI Forensic Genetic Genealogy Team. We had conference calls with them and updates several times a day. It was imp I was impressed about their willingness to work with our team. What we know of as DNA analysis has often relied on the comparison between evidence and a database of criminals and their DNA profiles. This is now taking that genealogy DNA, the 23andMe, the Ancestry.com, those consumer kits that are out there, and comparing the evidence to that. So it's a much wider field, and it's a whole field of people who might never have had any other sort of law enforcement contact that would have required them to submit DNA to a criminal database. So it's like saying, if you strike out over here, we've got a whole new field of opportunity for you to find a suspect in there, or at least someone who might help lead us to a suspect. Because it doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna find a criminal in that public data, but you might find a relative, and a relative close enough that we can start to do traditional genealogy research and work our way down the family tree until we get to the suspect. Investigators were concerned that there wasn't sufficient DNA preserved to create a viable sample. One of the first things they had to do, and this is the key to this kind of research, is they had to go and find out if they still had raw DNA evidence. Because whatever's in the CODIS database is not in the right format that can be compared to the open source public DNA that we all might upload from our family research. So it's like apples and oranges. So they needed to go find the raw materials and build a geotype that could be compared to these databases. We didn't think we had enough. We thought we had used the entire sample. We scoured our property rooms. We looked in our refrigerators that hold our biological evidence. And we were able to find some extracts from previous tests that we were able to develop the profile through. Those swabs were then shipped to a company in Texas, and they conducted analysis on them. On April 10th, 2019, police were contacted by Gene by Gene Limited and told that they were able to create a profile based on the swabs they had been sent. Once that was found, um, they were able to get that to the FBI and it was able to get uploaded into a database that we could work with. Initially, the search came up with numerous hits. That profile gets submitted to the genealogy databases. From there, we get a list of uh, people who share DNA with our suspect. Those relatives were in the second to fourth cousin range. So this was obviously huge because they now had a family that they could identify, but it still involved going through hundreds of different people to identify who the suspect was. 
It's like any genealogy database. They get thousands of names back with, you know, this person is a closer relative than that person. So yeah, we had a lot to look at. From there, we just, they told us how to build trees. We built, we used the tools in the database. And we did it for 10 to 12 hours a day for probably two weeks. We had to build back four generations. And then we had to build back down to present day. And we were looking for males that would have been between the ages of 16 and 60 in 1984. I believe in the end, we had upwards of nearly a thousand names that we had in our trees. After all their hard work, investigators were worried they'd reached another dead end. We had actually been kind of frustrated because we had been working on it for quite a while. We had been building the family trees and it just did not seem like we were getting any closer. And one of the FBI agents actually kind of took a second look and said, you know what, I think we're missing something and went back and identified another potential tree that we started to build off of, and we were able to develop our suspect based on that. We're looking for someone, uh, someone that had ties to our community. We started working in March of 2019 and finally came to two brothers that were from the area in September of 2019. Almost 35 years after Tracy Hammerberg was murdered, police were finally closing in on her killer. The two brothers were identified as Eugene and Philip Cross. The Cross brothers had lived in the area of Port Washington and Sockville in the 80s. One of the Cross brothers was alive, the other was dead. To detectives, Philip Cross appeared to be the most likely suspect. Philip Cross was a loner. He didn't have a lot of friends. And for all the suspects they had, Philip Cross was never on their radar. Once we looked at his criminal history for our department, we said, this is our guy, it has to be our guy. Then we found out that he, was, he died of an overdose in 2012. In 2019, police in Ozaki County, Wisconsin, investigating the rape and murder of 18-year-old Tracy Hammerberg in December 1984, had finally honed in on the man they believed had killed her. Using revolutionary familial DNA techniques, the detectives had come up with the name of Philip Cross, one of two brothers that forensic profiling had narrowed their search down to. But there was a problem. On August 21st, 2012, Philip died of a drug overdose at the Diamond Inn in Milwaukee. And because of that, there was uh, an autopsy available, and that meant there was DNA from the autopsy. I went down to the medical examiner's office, collected that card, and took it to the state crime lab, who confirmed that that was the same DNA from the semen in Tracy and the DNA taken from beneath her fingernails. Police now knew for sure that they'd identified the killer. But just who was he? And how did he come to attack and murder Tracy? Philip Cross was a young man that had a lot of trouble in his past. He was a good looking fellow, but he was a loner and had a violent temper. When things didn't go his way, he acted out violently. He was kind of the outcast. It didn't seem that he really belonged to any one social group. Um, a lot of people knew of him. Not many would call him a friend. Police learned from talking to different witnesses that Cross had smoked Marlboro Reds, which of course tied in with the crime scene. Philip Cross had attended Port Washington High School. He was a few years older than Tracy. He found out that he did ride the same bus to middle school with, with Tracy. Police also discover that Cross had numerous interactions with law enforcement. Philip had quite a reputation from a young age. He was incarcerated a number of times. He had stolen cars. He had called a bomb threat into his school. He was done for drugs. He was uh, convicted of a forgery charge and sent to prison in 1983 and was released from prison in 1984. He came back to the community. At the time of the homicide, he was working at a factory. He had a very volatile temper. His colleagues said if things didn't go his way, he would very much lash out. 
So this was someone you didn't really want to cross. If his sexual advances were spurned, he's the kind of guy who would have turned violent. At some time after the murder of Tracy Hammerberg, there was a female who had told Sheboygan Police Department that he had been in a car with her, and when she spurned his advances, he put a belt around her neck and attempted to strangle her. She said that if it wasn't for her getting away, she's sure that he would have killed her. Police interviewed him about that, and he gave a different account, and nothing came of it. But there was sort of a, a signal out there that this is a guy who is prone to be violent with women. It really struck me in, in doing the story that there were all these times that he was in custody after 1984, and no one knew they had Tracy Hammerberg's killer. They couldn't have known, because the crimes he committed didn't require the submission of DNA. If they had, then this would have been solved a long time ago. Detectives were now able to piece together the events of the night Tracy was murdered. It was totally senseless. It was a crime of opportunity. He found Tracy, she was vulnerable. At the time when Cross had finished work, that would have been the same time that Tracy was walking home from the party that she had just been with, with her friends. Tracy would have accepted a lift from him because she knew him at school and she knew him through her brother. So at that point, they may have wanted to have another drink or take some more drugs. So she may have guided him to the Sariaki driveway because she knew that location. It sounds like an absolutely brutal murder. Um, terrifying, first of all. Who knows what it's like the moment you recognize that the person you're with, maybe you're partying together, maybe you just think it's the guy giving you a lift. He suddenly turns, he's making sexual advances. You're trying to stop him, he's becoming violent. You're being sexually assaulted and violated in a way you never imagined. Police believed that Cross had probably made sexual advances towards Tracy, and when she rejected him, he lost control. I think just the fact that he couldn't get his way was something. I don't think he could control himself. I think the violence was his way of coping. One thing led to another, you know, and uh, they probably got to a point of no return. It appeared Tracy had put up a tremendous struggle. DNA was recovered from underneath her fingernails, indicating absolutely she fought back. Uh, she was fighting for her life. I believe she was strangled first, raped, and then bludgeoned to death. It disgusted me that someone would treat another human being like this and a young girl, and that they had got away without being caught for so long. The fact that the Tracy Hammerberg case was brought to a conclusion was a story in itself. After three decades, police had finally identified the killer. It was incredible. Everyone probably thought this case was never going to be solved. When we did the story 10 years ago, I thought we were going to get a resolution. I thought, you know what? It, someone's going to see this. They're going to get the lead they need. They're going to get the match they need. And, and year after year went by and nothing happened. And I started to believe we're never going to know who killed Tracy. So for this to finally be solved, it's a big deal. I think all law enforcement officers take cases home. There's those that stay with you. There's those that you want to help and make sure there's closure for the family. And for Tracy's case, there was we needed closure for the community. And that was important to us. This was absolutely tragic because this was a young girl with her whole life ahead of her and it was tragically taken away from her and stolen from her by this violent killing. I think for Tracy's family, this is the closure they've been waiting, you know, most of their lives for. For the ones that survived, you know, for her sister, for her brother, for her parents who were gone, um, you know, they never got that closure. Some people in the community maybe thought that we weren't still investigating it. We were. Tracy's picture was in all of our interview rooms from the time that she was murdered. We never forgot about Tracy. We don't have all of the answers. And there's still a small time frame where we don't know exactly what happened. What set Philip Cross off? I don't know that. That bothers me. For the family of Philip Cross, there was some closure too. But they must live with the knowledge that their relative unjustifiably took the life of an innocent teenager. 
they didn't do this. So I try and afford them the same respect that, you know, we did for Tracy's family. I do think, you know, they're caught in a situation that is hard, going to be hard for them as well. I had mixed emotions. It was great that we found out who it was, but I really wanted Philip Cross to be alive. I wanted him to face us, face Tracy's family, face the community for what he did. He stole Tracy's life. He had the ability to live his own life however he wanted. Tracy didn't get that. He took that from her. There are no winners in a case like this with tragedy and heartbreak at its center, but the only positive to emerge is the overwhelming power of modern forensic technology. Well, we never would have solved the case without genealogy, and it probably kept some innocent people out of jail. This case had so many people that were looked at so hard, and we were so sure that they were our, our guy. And had it not been for the science, we probably would have pursued a conviction on some of these people that didn't have anything to do with it. By the time we solved the case in 2019, over 400 men had been eliminated from the case. Philip Cross's name wasn't in our case file. He wasn't associated with this homicide at all. I think if this technique hadn't existed, we might never have found out who killed Tracy Hammerberg. It's pure science. It allows us to identify people that do crimes, especially sexual assaults and homicides. So whatever tools we can use to find them, protect other citizens, and to bring them to justice, I think it's an important tool. They kind of lit a fire under all of us and to want to do more of this kind of, uh, of investigation. I think from television shows, we've always been led to believe that murder always leaves a trace, that it's like the CSI effect. Every murder can be solved with a little piece of hair or a fabric of carpet. And I didn't always believe that was true, but this changes the game because there's certainly the potential to solve almost any crime, it would seem. Alongside that technology and of equal importance is the dogged work and the commitment of the investigators, the Bloodline Detectives. This was quite an incredible case. The police officers never gave up. This lasted over 30 years, and it's just amazing that they were able to bring the case to an end. I admire how persistent they were. I think it's hard not to have admiration for the kind of consistency they showed over the years, because again, this wasn't a case that was just shoved in a, in a drawer. They kept it alive. I feel very proud to be a part of it. It's also very frustrating that it took this long that we didn't get it right, that there's things that we didn't come across that would have pointed us in this direction sooner. I was proud to be a part of a, a, a team that worked together at a, at a common goal and that we succeeded. That was closure for us. Because ever since I've been working at the sheriff's office, this case was open and it's now closed. It was inspiring to see how, as a team, Law enforcement really can make a difference. I mean, this was a team effort all around. So it kind of gives you hope. It shows the community that we're not gonna give up. We had a task, we were gonna find who killed Tracy. We didn't stray from that, and we saw it to its end, its rightful end.